There are also these words from the Apostle Paul in Romans. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord. Please rise now in body or in spirit for the singing of God's grace and God's glory. Eternal 
God, your love for us is everlasting. And you alone can turn the shadow of death into the brightness of the morning light. Help us to turn to you with believing hearts. In the stillness of this time, speak to us of eternal things, so that hearing the promises in Scripture, we may have hope and be lifted into the peace of your presence. Your spirit is praying. Amen. In the back of your bulletin, you will see Psalm 23. It is to be read responsibly if you read the parts in full. And yes, using the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, and they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies, and thou anointest my head with oil, my cup. Surely the goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Then the camel will now come forward Because we look not at what can be seen. 
seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building of God's, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. Well, it is appropriate at this time to pause and spend a few moments to remind ourselves of God's promises and to reflect upon and celebrate the lives of both Nancy and Vance Vanderbilt. Well, days after Vance's passing on March 12th of last year, 2020, basically everything was shut down because of the pandemic, including the church. But within a few days, we were able to have a family gathering graveside service for Vance in his small hometown of Dakota, Texas, just south of the Red River, north of Paris, Texas. But Nancy and I, as well as the entire family, kept a close eye on the calendar to see when it was safe to have a traditional memorial service for Vance here at the church. And I cannot tell you how many times that we scheduled a tentative date, only to have to cancel it because the pandemic only got worse. And this was very hard on Nancy, as I know it is and was for the entire family. And on the one year anniversary of Vance's passing on March 12th of this year, the family and a few friends were able to gather many over Zoom video and Nancy song to share remembrances of Vance. But not to be deterred, as Jennifer mentioned, Nancy still drew up in the order of worship for a traditional memorial service for Vance here at the church. And today we are following the service that she planned. <coughs> but sadly, never came to be until after her own passing in September of this year. Therefore, this is indeed a unique service, in that we are reflecting upon the life and love of both Vance and Nancy, and trusting them into the eternal and the loving presence of God. Within the Presbyterian tradition, a service such as, as this which, uh, by the way, the Vanderbilt's were very Presbyterian <laughs> and deeply moved. The official title of a service like this was A Service of Witness to the Resurrection. As such, we understand the primary promise of the resurrection story, whether taken literally and or metaphorically, is that death does not have the final word, that there is life beyond life, whatever that may be like. And it's crucial then that we remember this as one of the foundational promises of God to be found in Scripture. So as we reflect upon the mystery of life and death and eternal life, know that Nancy and Vance are now experiencing the reality of eternity. Their eternal home with God. And know that God also promises to come from those who mourn. And even with the passing of time, the grief of their loss remains. It does for you, as family and friends, and it does for this community of faith. It's called chill as well. The words described to Jesus in the Gospel of John encourage us not to let our hearts be troubled or afraid because the Lord offers us the peace that only God can give. And it's also important to remind ourselves of the promise found in Romans 8, 39, that nothing in all of creation can ever separate us from the love of God. Not even death. And that is true for each of us. And that is true right now for Vance and Nancy. And in the broader Christian tradition of worship service such as this is also meant to weave together memory and hope. And the church's worship locates us precisely between a past that we respectfully remember and the future into which we put our hope. 
Psalm 62, 5 and 6 state, For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. And seeking to provide words of assurance and hope in the face of death, the Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. But while acknowledging we rightfully grieve and mourn the loss of those we love who have passed away, Paul reminds us that as people of faith, our grief is not swallowed up by hopelessness. But no one knows for sure what life after this life will be like. Again, our hope rests in the belief that it is spent eternally in the loving presence of God. So may that hope be a profound source of comfort and strength to you today and always. And on this day, as we have over the past year and a half and over the past three months, we hold the memory of the life of both fans and as you with reverence and with respect. And I know that you, all of you, have brought treasured memories of both of them today. Many that will be shared in a few moments by family members and friends. So it is my hope that together we can serve as a community of memory. For those memories are indeed one of the most significant elements of their legacy to treasure and to pass on to future generations. And although the words spoken this day cannot possibly encompass the totality of their lives, it's abundantly clear to all who know them that Nancy and Vance share deeply and with gratitude what it means to love and to be loved. So before coming members here at College Hill Presbyterian Church after their move from Eureka Springs, Arkansas. They were active in a special Presbyterian congregation here in Tulsa known as the Church of the Advent, a somewhat non-traditional model of being the church to say the least. And let me share a reflection from Laura Densey, a member of that congregation who is here today. Nancy and Vance were two of my parents, Joy and Ivy Dempsey, best and most beloved friends. They were admired as significant leaders in the building of John Knox Presbyterian Church and the formation of the Church of the Advent, not to mention their civic and business contributions to Tulsa and in Eureka Springs, while they parented a wonderful group of children. Nancy and Vance will remain in my heart as wise and caring mentors to me, to my very dear friends, and to the Dempsey family. I am grateful for so many wonderful memories of interesting and happy times in gatherings in my Tulsa home and at Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. Ghost Ranch, by the way, is a national Presbyterian conference center located in beautiful mountains outside of Abiquiu. Now, Charlotte Burke, who is also here today, and a long-time dear friend of Nancy and Vance, currently a member here at College Hill, but also part of the Church of the Advent, shares this. I first met Nancy and Vance at a Sunday evening Church of the Advent service. Nancy was immediately noticeable as someone of a pied piper, playing a tambourine and dancing with the children as we sang. She was so full of life. I think of her that way. Full of life. She had a powerful sense of being called out like the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles to do God's work. She inspired and somewhat challenged the rest of us to do the same, which wasn't always comfortable. But I loved her for Vance and Nancy were masters at saying on the campsite. Their camps at Ghost Ranch were the envy of most of the tent campers, and these were the days prior to anyone bringing an 
lead to the wreckage. They actually rig up all kinds of even louder shade protection, and their tent would be replete with rugs inside and out to try to defy the sand from entering. And I felt, though, as though I was visiting an important Arab dignitary, but eventually to their camp. The pants always amazed me. It seems as though he could do everything and anything. He exhibited his faith and love primarily through actions rather than words. But he amazed me more than once with his insight during a whole four Bible study. His hearty laugh always warmed me from the inside out. He was one of those people you knew would be there for you if you needed him. Steadfast in his love of his family, his church, his friends. Nancy and Vance were good and faithful servants. I will miss them, but I rejoice in having them in my life. Thanks for sharing that, Sean. And I can add that Vance was a man of few words. Stall word and support, as you always do, hope ever that he was deeply caring and involved in his own way. And he served faithfully as an ordained elder in the Presbyterian Church USA, and while at the church in Eureka Springs, he served as their treasure. And I consider Vance to be one of the wisest and finest representatives of what it means to be a faithful Presbyterian in the best sense of that word. For inclusiveness of others, set an inspiring example of faithfulness to the ways and teachings of Jesus. She even served in a national capacity the Presbyterian Church USA, and she was also an ordained ruling elder in our denomination. Now concerning Nancy's involvement in working with the denomination, daughter Jennifer provides this summary. The General Assembly of the newly reunited Northern and Southern branches of the Presbyterian Church in 1983 directed that a hymnal be developed using, quote, inclusive language and sensitive to the diverse nature of the church. A hymnal committee of 18 was created representing the breadth and diversity of the church, including hymnologists and professional musicians. Members of the committee were from small and large churches and represented the ethnic diversity of our denomination. It began its work in 1985 and concluded in 1989. Seventeen meetings were held along with countless subcommittee meetings. Locations reached across the church from all over the United States. And it was while on the subcommittee that Nancy worked, she met many leaders of our denomination. She was very proud of her work. She would travel with her violin and in the evenings play and sing with the musicians, including Jane Parker Cooper, who contributed several hymns to that hymn. When the committees and subcommittees work was done, the Presbyterian hymnal of hymns, songs, and spiritual songs was complete and published in 1990. And Nancy spent countless years, wherever she was a member of the church, on worship and music committees, including here at College Hill. Well, I will and do particularly miss her voice and wisdom on our worship and music community. And I want to pause now to transition into a special time of remembrances from family members and a dear friend, all of whom will introduce themselves. And then afterwards, I will have a few closing words. Uh, and at this time, the four of you, if you would, to please uh, come forward and, and sit here. And when it's your time to uh, come up to the pulpit, you can remove your mask.
here uh, to remember and memorialize the lives of Robert Vance Vandenberg and Nancy Ann Bruxton Vandenberg, husband and wife, father and mother, papa and grandma, and great papa and great grandma of 67 years. Honestly, as I reflect on my parents' life, I find it mind numbing and scope and riches. They lived by the cars and had a significant and positive impact with their personal lives, their family, and community. So rather than be blinded by it all, I decided to speak with what makes Vance and Nancy so special. To begin, both were humble beginnings, making the best of what they had. Dad, born in 1930, youngest child of Sally Marshall and John Vanderbilt, was raised in what we used to call a dirt farm in Chicago, Texas. Life was a hard scrabble existence. Money was scarce. They lived off the land. Dad was one of 11 graduates of his high school in Chicago. Encouraged and mentored by his older siblings, he attended Northwest Northeastern University. Oklahoma Navy. After serving two years in the Pacific with the Navy, um, he transferred to the Navy. Encouraged and mentored by his older siblings, he attended Northeastern Oklahoma and after serving two years in the Pacific with the Navy. Nancy Ann at a college dance. Now, mind you, Mom was in 1934, born in 1934, so Vance and Nancy were three and a half years apart in age. She was probably a high school junior at the time who lived in the high school in its campus. <coughs> Mom had a special knack for music, singing and playing violin. Mom's dad, Frederick Buck, a World War I veteran, traveled the Midwest as a cell representative. She was the oldest of three who, due to the nature of her father's job, lived in many places while growing up, including where she was born in Little Rock, Corpus Christi, and Tulsa, and then Independence, Kansas. They had to drive between Miami, Oklahoma, and Independence to visit and get to know mom and drive the time of two hours. She graduated from high school in 1952, and they were very shortly thereafter. They did not let their humble backgrounds hold them back from jumping into life. After two years at AM, they had transferred to the University of Oklahoma and graduated from the business degree. Mom and Dad lived several places, including Dallas, Texas, until they finally settled in Tulsa in 1955. Dad and Mom had children of the Depression, who soon had a growing family of three me, Tracy, and Jennifer, unleashed unique skill sets in ensuring we were provided. Dad raised chickens for eggs and food. Mom mixed store-bought milk, 50 50 with powdered milk and canned milk. Spam was not out of the question. Dad would refurbish side tables of sleds in the snow and hand fashioned cots and bow and arrows for us kids instead of running for the store. Nothing went to waste. During these years, Dad's work providing accounting services, giving gaming to CPA and Mom raising us kids. Mom also was, an act, was active in the Presbyterian Church and was ordained an elder in 1961 when pregnant with their fourth child, Adam. This takes us to the other factor that gave Mom and Dad special: their love and support of family. Mom's parents, Buck and Elizabeth, Beth, lived around the block and we spent much time with them. We'd drive four hours to the Chicago Farm every other month, spending Friday evenings through Sunday afternoons visiting Dad's family. It was common for all of us, with Dad and Mom's siblings and their growing families, to spend time together. Importantly, Mom and Dad provided opportunities for us to have fun and enjoy life. Mom would engage us in craft projects, such as creating angels for Christmas with gifts to gifts. She would ensure music was in our lives. Dad would pretend to be a ghost in the air before Halloween. He would turn off electricity, just like that. 
unexpectedly, and then you have the fireplace bit with a carved pumpkin, providing the only light in the house. He would make scary sounds under the sheet and would spread us screaming. Mom would come in at some point and save the day. When the streets were snowbound, Dad would tow his kids around the neighborhood from the back of the car with a large shed he had built. We would go camping to local lakes on weekends. We were always engaged in fun activities. Another special factor in Mom and Dad's favor is they never themselves stopped walking and learning, which they imparted upon us as we moved to adulthood. We moved to and lived in Nigeria between 1964 and 1966 to do a job my dad had to in an office in Fort Arthur. We spent much time while in Nigeria touring the markets and countryside. After returning from Africa, our family's, family's youngest sibling lived in this world. And now we were lucky, said the friends. That didn't hold long back from going back to school, earning both a Bachelor and a Master of Arts in Sociology at the University of Tulsa, graduating Magna Cum Laude. She also engaged in efforts to protest the war in Vietnam and learned to live life as an entire feminist, working in entire feminist, feminist setting an example for all of us. Dad decided to stop working for the man and instead work for himself. Purchased a down and out, over the wall bicycle retail store behind a loaded restaurant near 51st of Detroit. This at a time when a new craze was about to hit the United States, European intensity funds. He grew the business over several years at different locations. <laughs> Another special factor giving of themselves on behalf of building a better. During turbulent times in the late 60s, they both helped establish an experimental church, Church of the Abbey, which served the local street communities, which eventually opened the Tulsa Street School and a free clinic. Mom worked for a period as the executive director of the YWCA and as a social worker for the Head Start program. They also involved themselves with activities of ghost ranching in New Mexico where Dad served on the board of the National Ghost Ranch Foundation. Spending time at Ghost Ranch was important. And my dad, of course. It provided my mom time to fellowship with the Presbyterian family and recharge the spiritual values. Her love of the desert in the Southwest was reflected in her personal style and her own life. It would have been plenty special had Vance and Nancy stopped right here and now, but they didn't. They had one course. Mom and Dad moved to Rick Springs, Arkansas and started a new life. They bought a property on Main Street and opened a brand new business, Ozark Outdoors, living on the upper level of the building. They continued to run the bike shop in Tulsa. They volunteered for local business and church activities. They finished raising their, their younger children, Adam and Lydia, and provided a comfortable, home for all of us together, outside of the river springs on Beaver Lake. Many family members derived from our dad. Dad playing Santa on Christmas for the grandkids, taking a motorboat and out for a spin on the lake, and playing dominoes late with the evening. Dad also engaged, engaged in genealogical research of her family, bringing to life many of her relatives from the revolutionary and civil war eras. They even sponsored a family trip for our siblings and their grandkids and spent Thanksgiving in North Carolina and enabling us to visit uh, nearby locations where our ancestors as ancestors lived. And speaking of travel, they love travel. Several times to Europe with friends and family, and a special trip my mom and I both made for Janine and I with our children to spend two weeks touring through the Great Britain and Scotland. The last three days of the trip, my dad spent on a double decker touring bus since he was awful and he was bringing his ankle while showing the kids acre his wall. Another time, we had Kuhn with family for another Thanksgiving. They kept traveling until they no longer comfortably could, which only occurred a few years ago. One 
of the things I came to cherish as I came into adulthood was and becoming a parent myself, was remembering the personal moments mom had with us as children. Both my parents maintained high personal and ethical standards. One lesson I learned from mom, I carry with me today, is no matter the level of discipline she might dispense for my misprints, if she believed her justice was too harsh, she always personally took me aside and her apologies were always sincere from the heart. I remember a time when in seventh grade, I came home from school and told her how our geography teacher had instructed the class why America needed to be in Vietnam, i.e., the falling dominoes theory. She then proceeded to lecture me why we shouldn't be in Vietnam, and then asked me questions about what she conveyed to ensure I got the point. What made Dad special in me? He always kept his upbringing on that hard scrabble farm close to him. He not only used his life lessons for us children, but also for entertainment value. Like chores, he had me perform around the farm, around the house, as I was growing up. My list was always long mowing, raking, digging garden beds, helping him solve logs, sweep the patio, you name it. As I grew up in early adulthood, he always expressed an interest in my activities and asked to their purpose and where they might be. He had also, he had also many, he had, he had what many today consider peculiar habits that we thought was normal. For example, his favorite dessert was leftover cornbread, left soaking for several hours in a glass of butter. Working with hogs, Quite a bit growing up, he knew the hand in hand, high in the fireplace of blue, with a fire going all day for the Sunday smoke camp. Working and being around farm animals, he could mimic them all. For entertainment with friends around the campfire, he would provide example, examples of farm animal calls and end them with the most interesting and scary vocalization of them all. What was that? A bull in heat. <laughs> Never did. <laughs> <laughs> this is what terrified us as kids when he played ghost with us before Halloween. But as far as we knew, any kid could do this. So to conclude, Mom and Dad eventually decided to leave and have their last encore in line to be back at Tulsa. <laughs> For just a minute, I had not planned this, but I was looking through my mom's diary, and I wanted to read the first paragraph. This is a diary my father gave mom. He bought in Amsterdam when we were traveling to Africa, to Nigeria, for the first, uh, for the first leg of that trip. And this, these are her thoughts um, after being settled in Fort Hartford for a month or so. And Mind you, their background, they had never used higher health or were used to that circumstances. They always provided for themselves. So here we go. From, from my mother. There is a man now out in the garden trimming the trees. I'm at a complete loss to know. And is it really necessary? How much does he charge? Why can't the gardener? Perhaps he has even been sent by the company to do it for this as a company these towns. But I doubt it. This is typical of the events that present themselves to me each day now that we are somewhat settled here, now that we are somewhat settled here in the department. This diary is very special uh, to the family. Uh, she kept uh, her running thoughts in this diary. And a lot of times there were just reflections of the day. Some other times there were reflections on life in Nigeria. So we always cherish it. So, upon reflection, these are the things that made Nancy and Nancy so special. And we learned as they started the last thing on the morning night, we'll be back to Tulsa from Erie Springs. 
their commitment to each other was sincere and strongly felt. Undoubtedly, the many years of life challenges they faced took its toll at times, but they persevered. They both had well served and provided for community and family, but in the end, they also kept true to themselves and to each other. All of us who spent time with mom and dad during their last years was also witnesses. They were able to have a few of the last proportion years of Tulsa enjoy the which enabled them to focus on things providing pleasure, such as going to church, some limited traveling, mom reading and staying in touch with family and friends, and dad continuing his genealogical documentation. Their love of each other during their last years and the example they set for us and how they lived their life is what has made us and our community what it is today. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for your love and mission. Your life lessons will never be forgotten.
that describes right lines on the work of casualties. And she never lost her almost child Her openness to the world around her. She chose to remain vulnerable. Others would have closed off their hearts protected themselves. My mom wanted to see and hear and feel everything. And that is exactly what she did while my mom Chicano activist 
Reyes Lopez Tijerina, or exploring the Mesa above Canones, where the ancient ones Kivas were carved from the volcanic ash turned to rock. After my mother died the next summer, Nancy and Vance took me there and I had never gone, saying that my dad had taken them there. My father spoke proudly of Nancy learning Spanish, his second language too. Nancy said to me the last visit that I had with them in 2019 that our parents, a decade older than them, taught them a lot as young parents. It was Nancy and Vance who ended up being there for us each summer taking all of our kids and us out for a great New Mexican meal, and thus passing on values of attention and love, summer after summer, to our kids, where grandparents were not existing. My nephew Thomas, here with me today, became a life dude in his early teens in Albuquerque. Thanks to the Bible sent by hands. After Thomas, after Thomas was covering all 40 square miles of Albuquerque on that bike in his early teens, he later took that bike apart and learned about bike husbandry from Vance's gift. Wasn't it great to go to Louise and shop? I shot for our daughter's first bike at our 1997 visit, and guess what? Our daughter is a bike packer and sewer of bike packs. Nancy and Vance lived such a wide array of values. They are beacons and they value them. At the age of 33, losing my mom, Nancy helped me put into perspective that I need to worry about keeping a relationship with my mom's second husband, who had become so difficult in my mom's last years. Nancy taught me lessons I needed to learn to stand up for myself. I got to say that Nancy's keeping in touch with our old pastor, Milton Taylor, was always comfortable to me. I gave my father's cassette tapes of Milton Taylor's Old Testament classes at John Knox to Vance for safekeeping because Vance asked me for them. Vance and Nancy were both so hands on and inventive with their spaces. My memories of their homes on Truce, the dome in Arkansas that I only visited once, and their current home had interesting artifacts and do-it-yourself functional staff. Vance cemented my admiration when he shared the proposal that he made to Rose Ranch in the 90s. He offered to fund a housing structure there, designed by him for communal living in the desert with breezeways, with a flat to be installed with our parents' names. That wasn't an accepted gift by Rose Ranch, alas. But the love lingers for us Snyders. I am so grateful to their children for being such loving and interesting friends. And as Jennifer told me, we shall lean on each other.
spirit of life. As we have gathered to celebrate the life of both Nancy and Dan's manhood, we are again reminded that you are the creator of life, the comforter of the death. Be present with each and every one of us in our remembering, our celebrating, our letting go. Help us to always remember the times of laughter, the times of sharing, even the times of frustration, the times of pride, and also the times of growing, and especially the times of love. We give you thanks for the gift of your lives, for all of them that was good and kind and faithful, and for the abundant grace that you gave them. We remember and celebrate the gifts that they have given to family, friends, loved ones, the church, and to the world. We give thanks for the legacy that they now pass on to this and the future generations. Stay in our lives, we are thankful for the gift of life and the promise of eternal life. So bless all of you through our own living. As we seek to be faithful, liking, celebrating, forgiving, and grateful people. So we can do indeed now acknowledge that Nancy and Vance are with you, experiencing that reality of eternity. For your promises and for their lives, we give you thanks. So thank you for this sacred time of memory and hope. And hear us now as we pray together. Our God, who art in heaven, thou wilt be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The eyes of the and the power and the glory of the Again, as you are able to provide your spirit to be my form, I sing the mighty power of God. Acknowledge we come to pray, 
sheep of your own fold, lambs of your own flock, sinners of your own redeeming. Receive them into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in the land. Amen. And may God's peace, which passes all understanding, be deep within your heart and be carried with you this day. And know that as you go out this day and every day, that God goes before you to lead you in the way. That God goes behind you to encourage you. That God goes above you to bless you. God goes beneath you to support you. That God goes beside you to befriend you. And God goes within you to empower you to live your life to the glory of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer now and for it.